Good evening. It's great to welcome you to our Wednesday evening work through the book of Hebrews. This week we're in Hebrews chapter 7. Um, do join us after the message and we'll be breaking out into a Zoom conversation. There'll be quite a lot of things, quite a lot of questions that I'll sort of leave hanging a little bit during the talk that we can then pick up in a discussion a bit later on. I wonder if it ever surprises you when God answers prayer. When you look back perhaps at what's happened to you in, in recent years or recent times and you can see some of the prayers that you, you've prayed perhaps in anguish or on your knees and you then see that God has graciously answered them. It shouldn't su surprise us should it when, when our gracious loving Heavenly Father answers prayer but sometimes I wonder if it does catch us a little bit by surprise. But I think it's a good discipline to, to get into the habit of sometimes just taking stock and seeing what is God doing? What is God saying to me? How has God been working in my life? Because God works in big things and he works at sort of that, that high level, but he also works in detail. Just a couple of weeks back now, isn't it, since we um, sort of finished our Easter celebrations. And at Easter, the, the primary thing that we, we celebrate on Easter Sunday is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And we see there God working on this, this big scale, raising his son from the grave. And then for the next decades, the writers of the New Testament are working out, well, what does this mean? What does this mean that Jesus has risen? But also in those events that lead up to the crucifixion, we see God's hand in the detail. We see prophecies that are being fulfilled. Things that go back centuries where God has said this will happen and then we see them taking place. God's fingerprint, God's signature over his actions. Well, if you've got a Bible in front of you, if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 7, I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's quite long, so do bear with me, but we really need to read the whole lot to get an idea what the writer is going on about. So it's entitled Hebrews chapter 7, Melchizedek the Priest. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed them. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is from their kindred, even though their kindred are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by those who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth paid by the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still the need of another priest to come? one of the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests, and that what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest when an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he is a permanent priesthood. 
Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is blameless, holy and pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not, now, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes as we read your word, we find passages that are not easy. Sometimes things that can be confusing, sometimes that can sort of take us out of what we readily understand. And we just pray as we look at this very detailed and complex passage of scripture this evening, that you'll just bring us great clarity as to who you are, as our high priest, as our king, as our Lord, as our saviour. And Holy Spirit, would you enlighten, would you open your word to us this evening, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is not an easy passage. It would be a bit silly of me to suggest otherwise. And it deals with this, this character Melchizedek, who I'm sure most of us don't really know a great deal about. And even if you do know all there is to know about him, there isn't a great deal. There is a passage in Genesis, there's then that verse from the Psalms, and then there's the unpacking of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. He's already appeared a couple of times, mentioned in previous chapters, but now in chapter seven, he appears center stage and we can't ignore him. But to a first century mind, Melchizedek was not obscure. If you're a similar age to me, or perhaps you're, you're five years younger or five years older, and you were a teenager or a similar sort of age towards the end of the 1980s, you will know what a brossette is. Now, I don't think I've ever talked about Bross in a sermon before, but Bross was a band that was around in the late 80s. And there were quite a number of girls um, at my school who got really into this band and wore the clothes that they wore and had badges and all kinds of things. Claire assures me she never really got into it, but I'll have to check that out with her mum and dad. But if you were born after the late 80s, or if you um, were born significantly before, you will probably have no idea what I've just spoken about unless you went to their um, comeback tour in 2017. Because what happens in history in all kinds of different ways is that people become popular and then they fade out of popularity. Names become important for a time and a season and then a few years later they're just a footnote in history. Now Melchizedek wasn't part of a first century band but he was big in the thinking of the Jews in the first century. The Dead Sea Scrolls have stories about him some, some stories are, are quite fanciful. There is one particular story that talks about Melchizedek rising up as the deliverer of Israel. But essentially what we find is they are stories, they're things that people have made up about this ancient character. And Jewish thought generally in the first century is quite speculative and a number of other Old Testament characters, normally the more obscure ones, come in for the same treatment. So there are books about Enoch. Enoch, another character from Genesis who was so close to God that God and didn't allow him to die, but just took him to be with him. And here we have the writer of the Hebrews talking to largely a Jewish audience and saying, hold on a minute, Jesus is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So it's not too far-fetched, I think, to imagine him saying something like this. You know, forget the fanciful stories that you're hearing about Melchizedek. Here is something definite. Here is something God ordained. Here is something that God has shown us about Melchizedek that relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what appears to our eyes as a rather sort of left um, field type um, subject matter to bring in is actually a corrective from the writer of the Hebrews to contemporary Jewish thinking. So we get this proclamation that Jesus is from the priesthood of Melchizedek. So who on earth is Melchizedek? Well, we're going to have to go back into Genesis 14 to find a little bit more out about him. So this is Genesis 14, verses 17 to 20. The, the words will appear on your screen. After Abram returned from de defeating Kedalama and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet them in the valley of Shavar 
that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So what the writer of Hebrews does is now tells us quickly how this links to Jesus. So I'm going to go through this passage and sort of try and pick out the main threads. We won't go through it exactly verse by verse, but do try and stick with um, the, the sort of general themes that we find here. Verse 1, we find that Melchizedek is a king. He's king of Salem. Now, traditionally, this is thought to be um, Jerusalem. You get that Salem, that bit meaning peace at the end. And he is, um, he is a, a king. He's also a priest. But think ahead. Jesus, who is also our king and our high priest, was crucified in Jerusalem with that sign above his head saying the king of the Jews. Now the writer here is very keen for us to realise that all this happens before the Levitical priesthood, before all those rules and regulations that, that come in um, the law about what priests should do. And verse 10, it says that the writer says that the Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. If you want that in a slightly easier language, it basically means he hasn't been born yet. This all predates Levi. So the priests who would then serve later, those who were serving in, in the Old Testament temple, they are from the tribe of Levi. So you get Abram, who becomes Abraham, and then his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and then Levi is one further down the line. And as the law is given, the roles of the priest are affirmed. And one of these is that they would receive a tithe from the people. But Melchizedek, well, he predates all of this. He's before the Levitical priesthood. We don't know where he came from. Nothing is known of his parentage or ancestors. Nothing is known of his descendants. Jewish tradition suggests he was of the line of Seth, a firstborn. And that links in well with Jesus being firstborn from the dead. But we have to hold that lightly because that's only in Jewish tradition. It's not in the biblical records themselves. Verse 3, it says, He is without beginning of days or end of life. Like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Melchizedek is described as being like Jesus. He's in verse 17, and here's the quote from Psalm 110. In the order of Melchizedek. But notice what isn't said here. It isn't said that he is actually Jesus. Melchizedek isn't Jesus. Now some people have, have argued that this is actually a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, that that's what Melchizedek is. But I'd actually suggest that actually the writer deliberately doesn't take us down that route. He is like Jesus in many ways, but you can't be like somebody and actually be somebody at the same time. There is a picture of my granddad in World War I uniform. And every time I look at this picture, it is quite unnerving because it was taken, I think, probably something like 1916, 1917. And it looks just like me in First World War uniform. The, the sort of physical um, resemblance is quite uncanny. But I am not my granddad and he is not me. I may be like him. I never got to meet him. He died before I was born. I don't know whether I've got character traits that are the same, but we are not the same person. So I would suggest, actually, from what the writer says, is uh, that kind of idea of the two being the same, we have to put on one side. So my view would be, and we can talk about this on Zoom if you want to, is that what we find in Melchizedek is another John the Baptist type of figure, a forerunner, but before the giving of the law. A distant historical image of God's grace appearing in the earliest of times. A fusion of king and priest that predates Israel. And then we remember that Jesus is our king and high priest who fulfills Israel. So in one sense, you have the sort of the bookmarking of, of the two, you know, Melchizedek at the beginning. And then you have Jesus at the end who fulfills all that Israel was called to be. If you're into um, music, and it doesn't really matter what genre of music or art or literature, 
you will probably have um, people um, that you enjoy listening to, books that you enjoy reading, or artists whose work you enjoy looking at. And I think what you what you find is the more you get into a particular artist or, or musician is that you begin to recognise their work because it starts to have their fingerprints, their signature all over it. My background before I went into ministry, I was a piano teacher for about a decade and also as well as teaching piano during that time, I did a lot of accompanying work. So I used to play for choirs and orchestras and things like that. And it was all kinds of styles of music, but there was quite a lot of classical music thrown in there with it. Now, if you're into classical music and I play you a piece of Bach and then a piece of Beethoven, you'll be able to tell the difference quite easily. However, if you're not into classical music, they will sound fairly similar. It's only as you start to get to know the different styles and, and what the different composers are trying to achieve and the different sound palettes that they use that you start to recognise their fingerprints. It's only as we start to get into God's word, it's only as we start to get to know the Lord at a deeper level that actually we start to recognise the character of God. We start to recognise that God is consistent. He does the same things. He reveals his grace and his love and his mercy and his kindness in different ways throughout the generations. We get to recognize God's work through history, throughout scripture, and then in our own lives, we get to recognize the fingerprint of God when God has worked and we begin to recognize his voice speaking to us. And so this incident with Melchizedek, as I look at it, what, what I see, and you may find you see the same, is that it's got God's signature just all over it. God throughout the Old Testament is constantly pointing his people to what will come through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as you get into the New Testament, and Hebrews is one of the books that really deals with this in a big way, you find the writers looking back and actually saying, you see, God was pointing to Jesus all along. And so you see two things happening. You see that God points us forward and then points us backwards. God is not impacted by time as we are. He can see the end from the beginning. So let's not be surprised when we see God's fingerprints right the way through the scriptures. So Melchizedek, he greets Abraham. Abraham, who is to become Abraham, one of the great patriarchs. And yet what happens is Abraham, great as he was, gives a tithe, gives a tenth of what he has to this king priest, Melchizedek. But did you notice what else? Melchizedek does from the Genesis reading. He brought bread and wine. Is this a foreshadowing? We have to hold this lightly because it doesn't exactly say. But is he bringing out the food, the, the bread and the wine that then the Lord Jesus Christ said, this is my body, this is my blood. Is there another foreshadowing here? And Melchizedek then offers the blessing and receives the tithe. I don't know if you ever think, why do we give anything? Why do we give to God anything? Why does God call us to give generously to him? Well, one reason, and it's the reason we find here, is that God is so much greater than we are. We give back to the one who has given us everything in the first place. And we give to his priorities, not just taking all the stuff that God has graciously given us and then using it for our own ends. You know, if I spend money and I just spend money on the things that I want to spend money on, it actually turns me inward and it means that all I think about is myself. Whereas when I see what God has called me to do in terms of giving, both with money and then with resources and time and the rest of it, actually what I see is that I can start to have different priorities. I start to see with a kingdom vision. I start to see that actually God wants me to give so that the gospel can be proclaimed so that those who, who are suffering can find relief, so that God's work and the gospel can be shared across the world. The writer moves us on and he starts to talk about how Jesus' priesthood is greater than any other. It's not after the Levitical priesthood, it's not from the, the line of Aaron, but it's begout, without beginning or end. It's without spot or blemish. Why argue this? Well, two things very briefly that I think are important here. The first one is this. Jesus, the high priest, is from a different ancestry. 
The writer wants us to be under no um, illusion at all that Jesus is, is not from the Levitical priesthood, um, he's from the tribe of Judah, but he does have ancestry in terms of a priest. There is a model and the model is Melchizedek. If you're writing to people from a Jewish heritage, establishing this is a really critical thing because the, the, the readers of Hebrews, the people who hear these words will want to know, well, where is Jesus from? Why is he a priest? And this is what this explanation is all about. And the second thing is just like Melchizedek, Jesus knows no beginning or end. Jesus has always been. He is light from light, God from God. He has always been with his heavenly father. He was raised victorious and his kingdom will know no end. Melchizedek is like Jesus in that he's a priest. He is greater than Abraham from which the priests were to come and his priesthood is everlasting. So we get that passage in Genesis. We get the, the, the writings in Hebrews and then we've already looked at this little verse from Psalm 110 where it says, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. See, Jesus is not only a priest, but he is the fulfillment of the whole of the promises of God. Melchizedek was the first of the priests that we find, and Jesus is our final high priest, the one who is both priest and sacrifice. Verse 27, he is the once for all, the once for all. So when we celebrate communion, when we take bread and wine together, actually we're, we're not re-sacrificing Jesus, but we're just remembering his once for all sacrifice. Just to throw in a, a, a bit of, I suppose it could be described as Baptist thinking or nonconformist thinking um, that comes out of the Reformation of, about priests. In several denominations of the church, whom uh, you know, I am delighted to work alongside as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but we sometimes find that church leaders um, are called priests. They, they take that title. Now, it is true that as a church leader, you can take the title of priest, but it is never an exclusive title. Because all who are in Christ are priests. What an amazing thing. We are all priests serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in 1 Peter 2 verse 5, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing this evening to think that we are called to be a holy priesthood, the priesthood of all believers, all serving the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. So where does this leave us today? Where does all this talk of Melchizedek and Jesus and the relationship between the two, where does it leave us? Well, I just want to um, focus us on two things as we come to the end of Hebrews chapter 7. We've touched on, on both of them already to some degree. But the first thing is this, and it's about serving Jesus as our high priest. I don't know if you've ever thought about how much of the things that we do in life are quickly forgotten. Try remembering what you did yesterday and you probably won't be able to recall most of it to mind. A number of years ago, somebody um, gave me what I think has actually been really good advice on dealing with stress in life. And, and they said to me something along these lines. You know, sometimes things can come into our mind and we can get really stressed and worried and anxious about them. And this person said, well, try looking ahead. Think, well, will this thing matter in a week? Will this thing matter in a month? Will you have even remembered what this thing was in a year's time? Now, not everything falls into that first category. But a lot of things do, don't they? We can easily find ourselves being stressed and anxious about those things that actually, even a few days later, will have sort of fallen off the table, gone to the back of our minds. It's only six weeks ago, I think, that we had a panic over toilet rolls. And people were rushing around supermarkets buying toilet rolls and pasta and tinned foods. And yet Claire and I went to the, the supermarket on Friday afternoon last week. And you could have bought a whole stash of toilet rolls. That stress that we were all getting ourselves into has gone. 
And it's just a reminder that actually, we can so often fill our lives with things that we can get anxious about, we can stress about, that we can do, that actually, if we look forward, they won't actually matter that much in God's kingdom. It's easy to fill our lives, isn't it? But then we read Hebrews and we look to who it is we're called to serve. We see what Peter says and we, we find that we're priests serving our high priest who is Jesus, the perfect sinless son of God who died in our place, took our sins so we can have life with him. What would you do differently today if you thought of life as serving the high priest? What priorities would I put into my own life if I reflected that everything I do can be done as service to Jesus, the high priest? How much of the stuff that I let stress me actually happens because I've got this thing out of balance and because I'm serving myself and not serving the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a theme that, that Paul picks up in Romans chapter 12. And if you have the chance just later on, have a read of that chapter. But just one verse, Romans 12 verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Are we serving Jesus? Are we consciously those people who seek to do what God wants us to do in life? The second thing, is recognising God at work, recognising his fingerprints in our lives. How is God at work in your life today? Do you recognise it? Do you recognise those, those things that God is doing? One thing that, that continues to amaze me, and this passage in Hebrews 7 is, is just one that underlines it, is the consistent way that God reveals his character throughout the scriptures. He underlines it from ancient times and he keeps underlining it even today. I started this evening by asking us that question about answered prayer. Are you recognising when God is working in your life at the moment? What is God doing? What is God doing during this time where we're locked down? What is God doing in your life, in the life of those people around you? What is he doing in our shared life as a church community? Well, in a moment, I'm going to pray um, and then if you have got the time, do join us on Zoom just in a few moments, because I'd really like us to pick up with that as a question. What is God doing? How can we reflect and keep thinking about recognising the hand of God at this time? We can also chat about anything at all you want to about Melchizedek, if that is still something you've got questions or thoughts or reflections about. But let me pray, and then if you can join us on Zoom, please do there. All the information should be in the comment section at the side of the screen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this passage once again reminds us of who you are. It reminds us that you have died for us, that you gave yourself for us. It reminds us that you were um, the fulfilment of all of God's plans and promises. So we just pray for this day, for every day, that you'll help us to recognise when you are working. Help us to have lives that are open to serving you as our high priest. And we just thank you that you call us into your family. Not out of what we've done, but out of your love and your grace and your mercy. By faith, through grace. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.